Anybody still glad to be at church today? <laughs> Woo, we're beginning a brand new series today that I'm excited about. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But uh, we are pumped about Next Steps tonight. And I want to encourage you, if you've never been to Next Steps, maybe you've been going to church here for a year. Maybe it's been three weeks. Maybe this is your first time here and you want to know more about uh, why we do what we do, uh, more about the vision, discover how you can get involved, all of those things. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Uh, we'll have food for you there. And so be there at five o'clock. Um, this is at our home. And so we want to invite you into our home to be a part of that. And we'll be able to uh, walk you through a lot of what you might be curious about with our church. And so that is tonight at five o'clock. And then we're excited about everything else coming up that you just heard about serve day this Saturday, team night next Sunday night and uh, men's summit. I want to encourage you men, if you want to go, uh, you got a couple of days left to get registered. So make sure you go online and get your ticket today. And uh, I, I'm excited about this series. Um, come on, somebody, I think everybody looks a little sleepy today. I'm not going to lie to you from the platform today. You look like you're a little bit tired. Come on, look at the person next to you and tell them, come on, tell them, say, I like your shirt. I like your shirt. Come on, just lie to them. If, if you don't like their shirt, just lie. Just, just, you know, or maybe you just want to tell them your shirt, your shirt's all right. Um, I'm excited about this series and I want you to help me today and uh, lean in to what I believe God wants to speak to you. And what we're going to be doing in this, in this series over the next few weeks is we're going to be talking about the progress that God desires for you as a Christian, as a Jesus follower, as a believer. So the progress that, that God is desiring for you to make as you follow him. So if you've given your life to Jesus, you, you've, you've said, you know what, I'm giving my life to Jesus. You're saved. You've made that decision in your heart. You've prayed that prayer, whatever it looked like for you, but you're following Jesus. We're going to talk for the next few weeks about uh, that relationship with him and what God desires for our lives. And I want to kick off this series with a message that I have titled, Keep the Change. Keep the change. Somebody say, keep the change. And if you want to, uh, you're welcome to take notes. I encourage you to, to take notes. Or if you have the Bible app on your phone, you can get all of the message notes on the Bible app. So uh, you can click on uh, the more tab and then events and it'll pull us up and you can get all the notes there. Take notes on your phone. Uh, all of that will be there for you if that helps you. And uh, I, as we jump into this first message in the series, I, I want to ask you a question. And uh, really a couple of questions as we get going to kind of get you thinking, where do you desire to be? I want you to think about it for a moment. Where do you desire to be five years from now? Where do you desire to be five years from now? If you were to think in your mind, in your relationship, in your marriage, in your family, with your career, all of those things, where do you desire to be five years from now? Some of us would say, hey, I desire to have a new home. Come on, somebody. I want a new house. Uh, I want a new car. I want, you know, I want, I want something better than what I have. For some of us, maybe we want to be debt free, man. In the next five years, we have a five year plan. We want to be out of debt. We want to be debt free. We don't want to be having to deal with that anymore. Maybe somebody in here is going to go back to school and get your degree or further your education, or maybe your desire is to be married. Uh, maybe your desire is to be wealthy. Maybe you're, 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 you're hoping for that promotion. Maybe you're hoping to, to move to CEO in, in the company that you work for in the next five years. And you've been working toward that for a while. But uh, it's, it's easy a lot of times for us to see the future in our minds and think about, hey, in the next five years, this is where I want to be. In the next five years, this is what I want to accomplish. In the next five years, this is what I want my life to look like. But let me ask you another question. Where, where were you five years ago? Because it's also equally as easy to look at the last five years and think, I didn't get anything accomplished that I thought I was going to like. Like my life today does not look like what I hoped it would look like five years ago. Are you with me? It's easy for us to get discouraged and look back over the last five years and think, you know, well, I thought I'd be married by now. I thought we would be out of debt by now. I thought I would have a better house by now. You know, I went over to my friend's house and they have a better house. And now I hate my house and I want a better house. I thought... <laughs> I thought I'd be further along in my career. I thought I would have gotten the promotion three years ago and I still don't have it now. And somebody else came in and they're not as good as me and, and I'm a better employee than they are, but they're getting all the, you know, all the accolades and all the, all the stuff, you know, you're looking at me like you don't deal with that. You know, you deal with that. Come on. You're looking at people at work every day and think, I don't know why you get paid more than me. <laughs> you thought you'd be further along in your career. It's, it's easy for us to, to look back and think, man, all the stuff that we didn't get done 
over the last five years. But it's also easy for us to look at the future and think of everything that we want to get done, what we want our lives to look like. But I want to ask you this final question as we jump in, and then we're going to read a few verses and, and talk about it today. But what if the most important questions that we should ask ourselves as we think about where we want to be in five years from now, and I think we have these on the screen, what if these were the most important questions? Will my life reflect more of Jesus? And what in my life right now does not reflect Jesus? See, it's easy for us to think about all the stuff that we want. Now, we want to make more money so we can get a bigger house, so we can get a better car, so that we can you know, not be as stressed out about our finances and it's easy for us to think about all the stuff that we want with the promotion and I want to actually make it to the top and so I'm working really hard and, and I'm getting to work early and I'm going the extra mile and it doesn't seem like I'm getting... It's easy for us to think about those things, but what if the most important questions that you could ask yourself as you think about the next five years and where you want to be five years from now is, will my life reflect more of Jesus five years from now and what in my life right now does not reflect Jesus? What if it's not really about all the stuff? What if, what if the verse in the Bible that says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that everything else that you need will be added unto you? What if that's actually true? What if over the next five years, you, you, you purpose in your mind to seek God, become more like Jesus, figure out the things in your life that don't really reflect Jesus, and then you're seeking God and he starts to add the things in your life that you need. What if it actually works that way? And that's not what we're going to read today, but it's good anyway. That's free. <laughs> I want us to start this morning by looking at a few verses that Paul wrote to the Philippians regarding this progress that I think God desires for us. And we're going to start in Philippians chapter one and we're going to read verses three through six today and you can follow along on the screen behind me he says my prayers for you are full of praise to god as i give him thanks for you with great joy i'm so grateful for our union and our enduring partnership that began the first time i presented to you the gospel i pray with great faith for you because i'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you've never read it from this translation. I like to read this translation sometimes because of the way it words uh, the Bible, the Passion Translation. And it says that God has began. Come on, if you're if, if you're a Jesus, if you're a Christian, if you're following God. God has began something in you. And then Paul says, and he will be faithful to continue the process. Somebody say the process. The process of maturing you. The process of maturing you. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand today and, and admit whether or not you feel like you're a mature, mature believer, mature Christian, and mature follower of Jesus. But, but God, there's a process. There's something that God's wanting to do in you that's bigger than what you, I think, can comprehend. There's a process. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about three things that we need to kind of wrap our minds around today because they really matter in your Christian life. I mean, they really matter. We need to get these because Paul says, this is what God intends for you. I began something in you and I'm going to finish it when Jesus comes back. So all along the way, I've got you in this process. I'm working things out in your life. I'm doing some things. And so we need to understand these three things today. And they're very practical, but I think that, that it's something we struggle with and we need to understand. So here's number one. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Number one, you're meant to be set apart. If you're a Christian, if you're a Jesus follower, if you've given your life to him, you are meant to be set apart. I read this story this past week that I wanted to share with you today. I'm going to read it because I'll butcher it if I don't. And I thought it went perfectly along with this point. It says a father-in-law sits down with his family to eat a good steak dinner. Come on, somebody. Anybody enjoy a good steak dinner? Whew. He cuts. Good thing he came to the 930. Maybe you're not too hungry yet. 
He cuts the very best part of the steak and sets it to the corner of his plate. He is saving the best piece for his last bite. Anybody ever done that? You save the best. You know what you enjoy most about the meal, and you're like, oh, I'm just waiting on that. Come on. I'm away. I'm going to eat that at the end, right? And then those of us that have kids, you know that doesn't always work out. Because by the time you get to that, your kid's like, I'm so hungry. Well, I guess you can have mine. I'll sacrifice for you. He's saving the best piece for his last bite. As everyone is finishing their meal, the son-in-law looks over and notices the leftover pieces of steak. Not wanting the food to go to waste, the younger man reaches out with his fork, snatches the best cut, and sticks it in his mouth. And then I'll end with this, and it says, the father-in-law is angry, and I want to stop there. How many of you would be angry? <laughs> we can all relate to the message right now. <laughs> you set aside the best, the best part of the steak, the best part of the meal, whatever it is for you that you really enjoy, and you're sitting there eating together as a family, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law or your son or your daughter or whoever's there with you, you know, they're just eye, they're eyeballing your plate. Come on, I know I got some friends in here today that you better not touch their plate while they're eating. <laughs> I'm trying not to look at him right now. You better not touch their plate while it, it, it's a thing, right? You know, this is my food. You have your food. Come on. Anybody else like that? Like, this is mine, that's yours, you eat yours, I'll eat mine, you know, I'm not sharing my fries. And then and then somebody snatches the best part of it, and it makes you angry. Now, I wonder in your life if you've ever set aside something special. Maybe, now, I'm about to, whew, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get real excited about this, because I like going to the movies, and I haven't seen the new Avengers movie yet. So don't be coming up to me after church today telling me what it what it was like. Some of y'all were talking before church today while we were setting up about how awesome it was, and I haven't seen it yet. But anybody ever set aside time to go to like, you're like, oh, this is the movie, right? This is, oh, man, I, I'm going to get my popcorn. I'm going to get in there. And right now, if you go see it right now, you're going to be sitting like this, you know, with everybody else in the theater because everybody's there. We drove through town on Friday night when it came out, and there wasn't a parking spot in the movie theater, not one. I mean, people were just everywhere. And we set aside things like that, like, oh, we're just waiting for it, right? You know, Hollywood's good at this. They have these trailers that they play, you know, and the, the commercials and these little sneak peeks, and they just get you intrigued. And then you go spend all your money to go watch this movie. We set aside things like that. Or maybe maybe for you, uh, there's a TV show that you really like keeping up with. Anybody got a TV show that you watch all the time? Y'all not going to participate today. That's all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep sitting here staring at you until you participate. Anybody got a TV show that you really like to watch? I know we do. We have probably four or five of them uh, that we watch. Uh, not live, but we'll go back and watch them like the next day or something. Or maybe it's personal time for you to relax. Maybe it's a date night with your spouse. I know for us, that's, you know, we enjoy those times. Uh, <laughs> my wife said, yes, Lord. Um, we enjoy those times. We I know and for our family, maybe this is yours too. For our family, we set aside a week every year in the summer and we all go on vacation, you know, and it's like, woo, we're going to check out and get out of town and hang out for seven days and not have to worry about anything and just lay out by the pool or whatever it is that you do on vacation. We, we all probably have something that we set aside. We understand the concept of setting things aside. But I don't think we understand the concept that you were meant to be set aside. We understand the concept of things in our lives that we set aside. We're going to set aside this money. Oh, we're going to set aside this because this is where we're going. We're going to set aside this food. Oh, we're going to wait until Friday before we, before we grill that because people are coming over. We understand the concept of setting things aside, but I don't think we quite understand that we were meant to be set aside. We were meant to be set apart. This is what God has done with our lives. The Christian life is a life that God has set aside for his purpose. But too often we're consumed with so many other things in our lives that keep us from living the way that God intends. And what we're doing is we're snatching the thing that God has set aside. His purpose that he set aside for you. We snatch it with all the other stuff that we like to do. With all the stuff that we like to participate in. With all the, all the stuff that, well, I think I would prefer to do that rather than this. Even though I feel like this is what I probably should do. We, we snatch those things aside that God has put there for a purpose. So we need to understand that you're meant to be set apart. Here's number two. Here's the second thing that you need to understand. 
is that God wants to develop you. I didn't expect a whole lot of amens on that one. That God wants to develop you. He wants to take you through a process. <laughs> when you give your life to him. In verse 6, we just read it a minute ago. Uh, Paul says this, he says, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing, finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to talk to you about God's desire for your life. And it's found in this, this churchy word that we use sometimes called sanctification. I don't know if you've ever heard about this word sanctification. I'm going to try to break it down for you so you can understand what God's wanting to do in your life. It's this, this big word, sanctification. And, and I found this definition that most theologians have described. An imputation of Christ as our holiness, purification from moral evil and confirmation to the image of Christ. Now I'm going to break that down for you. Because some of y'all are looking at me like, that's a whole bunch of, whole bunch of occasions. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I completely understand it. Um, so with this, I, I, so I went and looked up the word imputation because I thought, hey, that's like kind of a transition word in this. That here's, here's what it is. It's a separation to God. This is how you describe that separation to God. And so I found this in statistics. This is what imputation means. It's the process of replacing missing data with substituted values. So we could, so I rewrote the definition of sanctification. Is that all right for y'all today? So that we could kind of wrap our minds around it. And this is, this is kind of what I felt like God dropped in my heart. It's the process of replacing what is missing in you with what God knows you need. This is why it's important. The process that God wants to take you on is a process of replacing what is missing in you with what you actually need, what he knows you need. You don't always want what God knows you need, but God's trying to do something in you. And this is why some of us are frustrated in life. It's because God's trying to take you on this journey, trying to take you through this process of replacing the things, the things that are missing in you. He's, he's finding those areas and he's trying to, to put what he knows you need in those spots in your life, but you're not allowing him to. And so it's frustrating for you. And, and, and sanctification begins when we accept Jesus. And God sets us apart as his children. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, Surely you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom realm. Stop being deceived. People who continue to engage in sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, sexual perversion, homosexuality, fraud, verbal abuse, or extortion, these will not inherit God's kingdom realm. But check out verse 11. It's true that some of you once lived in those lifestyles, but now you have been purified from sin, made holy, and given a perfect standing before God. How does that happen when you give your life to Jesus? Now you're in perfect standing with God. There's something that has began. All because of the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and through our union with the Spirit of our God. Here's what you need to, to understand. When you give your life to Jesus, God saves you and begins... A process. It's not giving your life to Jesus. Jesus is not the end. It is the beginning. When you give your life to Jesus, the process begins. And I think the reason why this is so important and why God is wanting me to go this direction for the next few weeks is because we need to understand what this process is that God's trying to take us on. That is frustrating some of us. And, and we're wondering why we're, why our spiritual life doesn't look like theirs or doesn't look like theirs or they seem like they're more put together than I am. No, God's trying to take every one of us on a process that began when you gave your life to Jesus. It began. That wasn't the end. When you give your life to Jesus, that means that you're on your way to heaven one day when Jesus comes back. But that doesn't, that's not, that's not it. Now God's trying to take you on this process and this journey and, 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 the problem is that many of us don't want to be developed. Can I go here for a minute and just get all up in your business for a moment? I need your permission before I do it because I don't want you to be mad at me and I want you to come back next weekend. M many of us don't want to be developed. We don't want to be developed. We can say it this way. We want salvation without sanctification. 
<laughs> Do I need to say it again? We want salvation without sanctification. Which then leads me to my third point. And we're going to spend a, a few moments here. You have to allow your life to be changed. You have to allow... Giving your life to Jesus is not the end all. You have to... It begins a process of God developing you from the inside out. And you have to allow your life to be changed. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can sit where you are and you can receive salvation and you can do nothing with it. Or you can make the decision that God now wants to develop me and so that I can become the person that he has always intended for me to be since the day that I was born. And I'm going to go through this process that God is taking me on. You have to allow your life to be changed. Allow. Somebody say allow. You have to allow it. God's not going to force it on you. You have to allow it. You see, the reason I titled this message, Keep the Change, was because I think there are many of us who may not be saying this out loud, but here's what we're saying with our lives. Jesus, save me, but keep the change. Save me from going to hell, but keep the change. I don't want the change. I don't want the process. I don't want the development. I don't want the character. I don't want any of that stuff. Save me but keep the change. I don't want the change. I don't like the change. Anybody in here like change? One person. <laughs> we don't, most of us, we don't like change. And this is the reason why this, we don't say this out loud. Come on, you don't wake up in the morning and be like, God, thank you for saving me, but I don't want to change. We don't say that. But our lives tell the story that says, God, thank you for saving me, but I want to do this my way. Thank you, Jesus, save me, but keep the change. We want Jesus to save us, but not change us. And here's what we need to understand today, that God never intended for you to get saved and stay the same. He never intended for you to get saved, give your life to Jesus, and stay exactly the way you are. Stay exactly in the same place that you are. Stay doing the exact same things that you did before you gave your life to Him. I believe that God intends for all of us to go through a process. And here's the part that we don't like about the process. It's a process that never ends until Jesus comes back. <laughs> we want a deadline. We're like, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And in five years, I'm going to have this figured out. And I won't be just this holy person that everybody's going to want to be like. You know what I'm talking about? And, 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 and just give me a timeline, you know, five years from now that I'll know I'll be in this place or whatever. Listen, it's a process that never ends until Jesus comes back. That's what Paul said. He said it began when you gave your life to Jesus. It was a process that began. But now you're in the process. And guess what, baby? The process doesn't end until Jesus comes back. God's going to be working things out in your life from this point until the end of time. But we don't like that. <laughs> Give me, I got a five-year plan. I'm going to be the most holy person on planet Earth in five years. I'm going to get this figured out. I'm going to read my Bible through three times a year. I'm going to do, you know, in the Bible app now they have those streaks. You know, I'm going to get a hundred in a row. Well, I read something. <laughs> That's my personality. I'm like, oh, man, if I miss a day on that Bible app, I'm like, oh, Lord, it's starting over. It's back in one. <laughs> some of y'all are like me. See, there's some. Sometimes we enjoy parts of the process, but a lot of times we don't enjoy God working things out in our lives. And Jesus, He said it this way in John 15 verses one and two. He says, "I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch, listen, watch this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He what takes it away." And every branch that continues to bear fruit, he does what? Repeatedly prunes. We don't like that. I don't like that. I'm doing good. I'm spending time in the word. I'm going to church. I'm involved. I'm doing all the right things. But it says every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly Prune so that it will what? Bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. 
The process never ends. It never goes away. You'll never arrive until you get to heaven one day. You will never arrive at where God wants for you because he's constantly got something more for you, something more for you, something better for you, something he's developing in you. It's a, it's a process. Oh, but I just want to be connected to the vine. I didn't really sign up for that pruning thing. I like that. I like verse one. You know, I'm the vine. He's the vine dresser. Going into verse two, I like that first part. Every branch in me. Oh, yeah, I want to be in you. But what happens when you're in him? He starts taking stuff away that you don't need. And the stuff that is producing fruit in your life, he prunes it. Here and there. Start pruning here. Little thing there. Little thing here. Why? So that you can produce even better fruit. It's a process. Here's what I know about God. He loves us enough to save us where we are, but too much to leave us where we are. God loves you enough to meet you right where you are. You don't have to fix anything. You can, you can come to Jesus today and you say, Jesus, just save me, forgive me of my sin. You don't have to fix anything. Nothing. If you've ever heard that you got to get yourself together before you can come to church, you got to get yourself together before you give your life to Jesus, you can't. Here's the, here's, here's the gospel. You can't get yourself together. I can't get myself together, but I can give my life to him. And then he starts the process. <laughs> he starts the process that's going to last the rest of my life. To where he's helping me work things out in my life. He's pruning things in my life. There's some things he's going to remove in my life. There's some things he's going to add to my life. There's, there's a process that I'm going to go through. He loves us enough to save us where we are, but too much to leave us where we are. And I think some of us today, we need to make the decision that we're going to allow God to work it out. We're going to allow God to work out what he needs to work out in us. We're going to allow our lives to be changed. We're going to allow it. And these things can be worked out so that we can accomplish what God's desire is. And that's for you to be more like Jesus. So I want to give you two things as we wrap this up. I want to go ahead and bring the worship team back up. To answer this question, how do we allow our lives to be changed? I want to give you just some, some starting places. And for some of you, you may be thinking, well, I'm already doing some of that. And for some of you, you might be thinking, yeah, that's something I need to start doing. But I want to give you just some starting places. And I think I've got three things here just underneath this point that I want to get to. And we're going to look at them very quickly. How do you allow your life to be changed? Here's the first thing you got to do. You've got to get in the Word. Because the Word is what changes you. If you want to allow your life to be changed, you've got to get in the Word. You've got to get up 30 minutes earlier in the morning. I know you like to sleep. I do too. You've got to, you've got to turn off the TV 30 minutes before you like to go to bed and open the Word. Open your Bible and begin to read something because the Word will change you. There are, there, it, it, it's, it's, it's fuel for you. It's food for you. It guides you. It leads you. It will help you make decisions. It, it does all of these things. And many of us, we don't have this in our lives. And so if you want to allow your life to be changed, the first thing you got to do is get in the word. Here's the second thing. You've got to apply the word to every area. Everybody say every. You've got to apply the word to every area of your life. Every area of your life. So you can read it, then you've got to apply it. You can read it, but then you have to apply it. And, and it even talks about this. I love the way that James puts this in James 1.22. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, check this out. You are only fooling yourselves. James is saying, listen, if you read it all day long, but you never practice it, you never apply it. You never do anything with it. You're fooling yourself. If you think that just reading it alone is going to change everything in your life that needs to be changed and going to get you in this process, you've got to apply it. You've got to apply it. That goes on to say that a person that reads it and doesn't do anything with it is like somebody that goes and looks at themselves in the mirror, walks away, and is like, I don't even know what I look like. you got to read it, and you've got to apply it. And here's the third thing. you you got to get around people who will challenge you to do it. You got to get around some people that will challenge you to do it. You got to read it, 
apply it. Get around somebody in your life that's going to challenge you. It's going to ask you are, you, are you reading the Word? Have you been Have you been spending time with God? Have you been growing? Have you been Have you been reading? Have you been applying? Have you What are you? You got to read it, apply it, and get around people who are going to challenge you to keep doing it. Challenge you to keep doing it. Challenge you to apply the word. Will you stand to your feet today? I believe there are some of us in this room today who are saved, but we're not experiencing the life that God wants for us because we won't allow Him to change us. We're not saying it in this way, but with our lives, we're saying, God, save me, but keep the change. I want your salvation, but I don't want to change. I, I don't want you to do anything in me. I don't, want, I don't want you to work anything out of me. I don't want to be any different than the way I am now. And God intends for you to be here. It's a process that begins when you give your life to Jesus. I wonder what my life would look like if I allowed God to change me. I wonder what your life would look like if you allowed God to change you from the inside out. If you allowed him to remove some things in your life, if you allowed him to transform some things in your life, what would your life look like? If you made the decision today, no more keep the change. I want to be like Jesus. No more going through the motions. No more, no more struggling through. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. What could our lives look like if we decided today? God, I give you permission to change me. I give you permission to change me. I'm going to get in your word. I'm going to get around people. I'm going to apply what your word. I'm going to do all of these things. So that I can begin to see something shifting on the inside of me. I can begin to see growth on the inside of me. I can begin to see uh, uh, something deeper, a deeper understanding inside of me. Uh, I can see a better walk with God than what I've been experiencing right now. It's time to grow. It's time to grow. That's what this series is all about. It's about this process that God is trying to take us on. That we are so we are stiff arming God from doing this in our lives. We, man, there are so many of us in here today, myself included, sometimes where it's like, we're stiff arming God, like, God, thank you for saving me, but I don't want that. I don't want that. And God's saying, listen, this is how you can experience the best life that I created for you, is if you allow me to take you through this process. If you allow me to take you through this process. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes today? God, we thank you today for your word, for speaking to us. God, I believe that you are going to do something that we can't even fathom as we go through this series and talk about this process of what our lives could look like if we would allow you to do the things that you desire to do in our lives.